gives life. It may be used more correctly or less correctly, but it is always positive. How a person handles water. If he approaches the water with good thoughts or blesses it and says thank you to it, the quality of the water will improve and the water will have a positive effect on a person and on his body. According to the Chronicles, in 1472, Abbot Karl Gastinsis was arrested on the basis of a false denunciation and interrogated in connection with having caused a certain prominent lady to fall ill. While he was being held in a dungeon, the abbot was given only a crust of stale bread every day, along with a dipper of rotten, stinking water. After 40 days, the prison warden noticed that Father Karl not only had not gone into decline, but he even seemed to have gained health and strength, which only served to convince the inquisitors that the abbot had connection with dark forces. Later, Karl Gastinsis confessed under brutal torture that he had recited a prayer over the rotten water he has given, thanking the Lord for bestowing these trials upon him. After that, the water tasted bland and turned fresh and clear. We have two containers of emulsified crude oil, which is a byproduct of oil production, a stable combination of water and oil, which remain bound in this state for years. The test sample is irradiated. The element will treat one container for seven days, making the water molecules lessen their contact with the oil molecules. After four days, we compare the test sample and the control. The water has separated from the oil. At the boundary between the water and the oil phases, there are crater-like formations. This means that the separation process is continuing. The fields we use to influence the water are comparable in intensity with the electromagnetic field of the human heart. On the seventh day of treatment, the experiment is over. The water has completely separated from the oil. Expert estimates that oilmen have accumulated around a billion tons of emulsified crude oil. It cannot be used for industrial purposes. Ultimately, they get rid of the emulsion, pouring it right onto the ground. And then horrible sludge lakes are formed in the oil fields. In the language of the Pemon Indian tribe in Venezuela, Roraima is translated as the mother of all waters. A group of Russian biophysicists set out for this destination in January 2005 to collect a unique sample of water, which scientists say has never been in direct contact with human beings. Such water exists in only one place on Earth, in Venezuela. According to one hypothesis, a continent called Gondwana existed in the southern hemisphere during the Paleozoic era. Powerful tectonic processes occurring in the Earth's crust three and a half million years ago split it into several parts. In this way, flat elevated plateaus were formed which the Indians call tepuis, meaning pillars. Roraima is the largest of them. It's a really remote place, very hard to get to. Three days of travel through the savanna, and then the jungles. Then you climb an 800-meter wall. It takes a certain amount of enthusiasm. Therefore, we can say, that the water we have there is in a unique virgin state.
There is always a large cloud over Roraima. As evening approaches, a light haze appears. When the moon comes out from behind the mountain, the mist begins to glow with an even blue light. And in that light is visible how fine droplets of moisture are hanging in the still air. The slightest breath of a breeze and this watery dust forms into drops. This is the origin of the rain which rushes down in countless waterfalls. So today is January 30th, 2005. Water collection number 16. Then we shall pack it all up in foil. And in this form, this water will hold its energy for several days with the air of these places. Then we'll arrive in St. Petersburg and we'll calmly carry out at our laboratory analysis several thousand kilometers away. And only then will we be able to draw any conclusions. Professor Korotkov's laboratory has developed an instrument that can determine the energetics of water. It works on the basis of the Kirlian effect. Everything that enters a strong electromagnetic field begins to emit light. The greater energy the object possesses, the brighter it shines. The water from Venezuela was compared with ordinary drinking water. We can say that this water is not double, not triple, but 40,000 times more active. So these are really two fundamentally different substances. And water of this type, this water which immediately activates the body, it activates the whole system. That's why there, when we were in those places where the Indians, despite the deprivation in which they live, live very long lives and are pretty happy. And they absolutely do not want civilization to come to them. In the late autumn of 1632, a poor farmer named Gentz from the village of Enningen in Hessen, an orphan, who didn't remember his parents or where he was born, set off for southern Italy to seek a better lot. His route ran through the city of Walschut am Rhein in the eparchy of Constance. Suddenly, Gentz was literally stabbed by the feeling that these places were very directly related to him. It was as if the shepherd's legs led him where he should go, which was into a grove. Entering it, Gens looked around. Not far away, a spring was coming right out of the ground. The young man approached it, bent down, and drank the water. Many years later, he told his grandchildren the story of how the water had given back him his memory so that he recollected these places and his father and mother and the house in which he was born. Modern science maintains that the water structure of each person's body is identical to the structure of the water in the place where he was born. Therefore, our internal connection to our place of birth is preserved throughout our life. And that means that the concept of homeland has not only a lofty poetical meaning, but also a quite specific physical content. Nowhere in the world is the water the same. Breaking its way to the surface, through minerals and ores, water assimilates the vibrations of the soil and information about its specific biological and energetical features. We tested this absolutely marvelous water 
which is sold in large bottles, and the producer puts a label on them which says, it's the best water in the world, but it is empty and dead. True, it's pure and it's good, and some minerals have been added, but this is dead water in which there is no energetics and there is no life. Most likely, people do not sense any particular difference between naturally pure and artificially purified water. But any animal will always choose water from a spring, because this water is loaded with natural energies. Not long ago, yet another unique property of natural water was discovered. It turns out that such water is flammable. The burning of natural water, the water itself burns, and the reason it burns is precisely that it is structurized in a special way natural water is. Burning, in rigorous scientific terms, is a process of oxidation in which heat and light are given off. In the case of water, it burns at the temperature of the environment, and the light emitted can be recorded using super-sensitive instruments. In burning, you have oxygen being continuously activated and some organic matter is continuously burning. So the burning of water is a process that's a little bit more extended in time, because if it were a process like that, then it would already have all been burned up. <laughs> On June 3, 1940, a note was tossed into the Soviet embassy in Germany. Its author requested to be contacted immediately. If this does not happen, my work with Heydrich will go to waste, wrote an agent, Willy Leichmann, codename Breitenbach. He hastened to report on secret testing facilities and work being done on making synthetic gasoline from brown coal using water. Back in 1913, Kaiser Wilhelm had ordered Franz Fischer, a leading chemist, to make sure Germany had liquid fuel supplies not having its own oil could put Germany in a weak position in the impending war. By 1941, German scientists had succeeded in obtaining fuel by hydrogenating coal. This fuel, however, was 10 to 12 times more expensive than natural fuel refined from oil, and it was of such poor quality that it badly damaged the military vehicles in which it was used. After the war, these efforts to produce fuel using water were abandoned as futile. For the past 15 years, researcher Zhang Guohua has been working to create fuel of this type. Now we shall demonstrate for everyone the process of preparing emulsified diesel fuel and show its two aspects. One aspect is increased energy and the other is the reduction of exhaust gases. This is fuel taken from an automobile structurized water. If we take the proportions, it is 79% diesel fuel, 20% water, and 1% emulsifying agent. What was added here is water. John shows us that what is added to the fuel really is water. Now we shall add the 1% emulsifying agent. An emulsified solution resembling milk forms immediately. We pour the emulsified fuel into the car and use it for propulsion. Measured over the long term, there was a 5% increase in power with over 20% fuel economy. Our government views this as very important. I think that not even all chemists remember this aspect. If you take gasoline and completely dry it out, it always contains some quantity of water. And if you give it a special treatment to remove all the water from the gasoline, the gasoline will not burn. This was known already in the 19th century. To burn anything whatsoever, there has to be at least some quantity of water. There is a legend among the Persian Sufis. Once upon a time, a wise man said that the day would come when all the water in the world, except for what had been specially collected, would disappear. 
and then different water would replace it. But anyone who drank the new water would lose his mind. Only one man took the prophecy seriously and began to store up water. But the day that had been predicted did not come, and every body of water emptied out. The man who had listened to the wise man drank water from his supply. And then the bodies of water and wells filled up with water again. People thirstily drank this water, and every one of them went crazy. But the man who had listened to the wise man continued to drink water only from his own supply and kept his sanity. And he was the only sane person left among the madmen, and therefore he was called crazy. And then he poured his reserves of real water, the old water, onto the ground. And he drank the new water and lost his mind. And the madman decided that he had become sane. Very a major part of our, our brain of our brains are water. So the water and the easy movement of the water molecules and so on will leave part of that imprint. So yes, to some extent, the water is implicated in the patterning of the information in the brain. Now when you look at organs, say the heart or the lung or muscles or the brain, then all that you can see in a simple NMR experiment is the water in these organs. The water, your head is full of water. There is nothing else but water, almost. That's mean, uh, there is a human being here. There is a water. Uh, and uh, this uh, water, if uh, this water has uh, very many kind of information, hmm? so if that uh, water uh, is injected to his uh, human body, this information will be converted, converted to the, to this uh, human being and. Uh, that may change the character of a human being. Let us see how this type of water affects human blood. The doctor is drawing blood from a patient's finger. Using a special microscope, we shall be able to see the condition of her body from this drop. These are red blood cells, and they've lost their electrical charge, so they're all stuck together in a formation called a rouleau. Here's a huge symplast. Symplasts are associated with heart disease and uh, arthritis and lung disease and many other conditions that could be coming in the future. The doctor asks the patient to drink a small amount of structurized water. After 12 minutes, the doctor again draws blood from the patient and studies it. So you can see that the cells then become buoyant, they become slippery, and they have their electrical charge, so they repel each other. That allows them to carry oxygen, and it means that we're changing the pH of the blood back to an aerobic environment rather than an anaerobic environment. I think that's utterly amazing. That, that a water could, that just drinking water could do that. Traditional Eastern medicine has been based for many centuries on the vibrations and resonance of the body's water content. The pulse indicates if the resonance tone is right. It is believed that the pulse may be strong, weak, cold, or hot. On the basis of this, an experienced physician carries out a kind of energy scan of the body makes a diagnosis and prescribes treatment. We do not heal with water because a person, the human body, is water. The person simply reads the mantras in order to correct the bad water he has inside. How this hidden effect works is not known. In all the world's religions, Christianity, Islam and Judaism, it is the practice to recite a prayer before taking food or to consecrate the food during major religious holidays. How often do we stop and think, what for? 
And how did the certainty arise in such dissimilar religions that this is the right thing to do? Why did something that science is only now trying to understand seem obvious to our ancestors? It turns out that the frequency of vibrations in the prayers of any religion uttered in any language is 8 hertz, which corresponds to the frequency of the oscillations of the Earth's magnetic field. Therefore, a prayer pronounced with love creates a harmonic structure in the water that is an ingredient of absolutely all foods. We now have some idea about how this happens through the structurization of water clusters, water molecules. Therefore, we can take some purely practical advice from this. To sit down at the table in a very good mood and under no circumstance to dine with cruel or aggressive-minded people because this will have a direct destructive effect on our health. In 1995, Dr. Emoto Masaru was the first one to record musical impressions on water. In Dr. Emoto Masaru's laboratory, they allowed water to listen to music, after which they flash froze the water. And then, under the microscope, they could clearly see the crystals that the water had formed. Here is what the music of Bach looks like. Mozart. Beethoven. Heavy rock. Sometimes it's just certain eruptions, emotional ones, which cause such absolutely negative results. I can't recall a case in which such a negative spewing out of emotions as this happened at a classical music concert. Experiments show that aggression causes a sharp change in water's memory. Such water can provoke an aggressive state in hitherto calm people. Strange as it may seem, evil interacts more easily and simply. Apparently, this has to do with the sensitivities of human beings, who always feel negative things more acutely. Dr. Emoto has conducted another interesting experiment. He placed rice into three glass beakers and covered it with water. And then every day for a month, he said, thank you to one beaker. You're an idiot to the second. And the third one, he completely ignored. After one month, the rice that had been thanked began to ferment, giving off a strong, pleasant aroma. The rice in the second beaker turned black. And the rice that was ignored began to rot. Dr. Emoto thinks that this experiment provides an important lesson, especially with regard to how we treat children. We should take care of them, give them attention, and converse with them. Indifference does the greatest harm. And I may uh, tell some uh, dreamy story, <laughs> but almost. But Practical experience shows that hatred, rage, and even annoyance not only exert a destructive influence on other people, but they also give feedback. This begins geistic in gedanken. Intellectually, at the level of thoughts, a person who sends negative thoughts is polluting his own water, of which his body is 75, 90% composed, and giving it 
a negative charge. Many laboratories around the world have repeatedly carried out an experiment that produces similar results. Water from a single container was divided into two portions. One part was subjected to an outside influence that changed the structure and properties of that water. The water in the second flask acquired the same structure and the same properties after a certain period of time. Even if the two portions of water were a significant distance removed from each other. The water has a very important uh, photographic memory, we can say that, and also you can imprint it with very subtle energies, even from 10,000 kilometers. Does that mean that remote communication occurs between human beings who are essentially structures composed of water? In February 2005, Professor Vyacheslav Zvonikov and a group of his colleagues conducted an experiment to confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis that remote communication between people is possible. Two people are 15,000 kilometers apart. One is in Moscow, the other in northern South America near the city of Santa Elena. Here we have the virtual brain of the experiment's participants. During the 15 minutes before the experiment begins, there are no visible correlations. The least change in posture, pulse, or respiratory frequency is recorded. ECGs and EEGs are taken. Suddenly, the instruments register distinct changes. The two people separated by this enormous distance have somehow tuned themselves to the same wave. The instruments show synchronization of certain areas of their brains, of breathing, and pulses. How can this be explained? We don't yet have any answers to that question. So far, this is a scientific mystery. There is a hypothesis that the body's liquids play a part in this. Most likely, and we do have a good deal to confirm this, 